Hi, I'm Paul Hopewell. I make all sorts of components in my workshop. These videos show you how I got on. In this video, I'm modifying a steering head from a 1950s Bond mini car. These steering unit components have all the appearance of a car crash, having been pried from the hands of a scrap merchant somewhere in the south of England. And it's been passed on to me to modify and make good. As you can see here, I've cleaned up all usable components and removed any worn and damaged bearings, which is all of them. My remit here is to rebuild this steering head using needle, roller or ball bearings, so I guess why not use one of each type. That means I've got to turn this into something resembling this. This one is one I did about a year or so ago. Just pouring the casting out for the bearings is easy. Getting them true is the difficult part. This is where I had to reverse engineer this component. The datum on this component is the bearing centre line, which is an imaginary line running through the casting central to each bearing that is also parallel to the back face and square to the bottom face. That means I have to try and accurately locate this imaginary centre line. After looking at this and many others of the same castings, it's of my opinion that this part was first clamped onto a jig and set true to clean up the back face. Then turned over onto another fixture, allowing much of the remaining work to be completed relative to the back face and the fixture, as datum faces. As I see it, the remaining work would have possibly been as follows. Skim the bottom face. Skim the top yoke face, bore the bearing seats, drill the fixing holes, skim the sloping face, drill two angle holes at 47 64 diameter, that's about 19mm, and drill and tap some fixing holes. Job done, sit down for five minutes, puff on a wood by and read the newspaper until the foreman sees you. My choice of bearings is for the following reasons. The bottom bearing used to be a greased friction cone and a cup device. The top bearing is a similar system. These have to be regularly greased and adjusted. Even then, under load, they were very hard to turn. As for maintaining a straight line along the roadway without having to constantly nudge the steering is at best tiring. Because of this unique steering system, the steering gears become distressed and wear at an unnecessarily fast rate. Instead of using conical bushes in the bottom of the steering head, I'm going to use taper bearing. There is already a taper bearing that fits as a direct replacement, but the cost is astronomical and the steering doesn't rotate at thousands of RPM, so it isn't necessary. There is a cheaper alternative, but it requires that the bearings OD be shimmed, only a tiny bit. After all, the steering hardly moves most of the time anyway. The top bearing is going to be replaced by two bearings, a needle roller bearing and a thrust ball bearing. The needle roller bearing is to prevent any lateral movement in the steering shaft to protect the steering gear and the thrust ball bearing is to maintain a good level of support and adjustment to the taper bearing below. In order to make the casting bore smaller, it's necessary to make a sleeve. For this, I'll use a section of good quality aluminium or aluminum and then press everything into place. I'm sorry if I bored you over the last four and a half minutes, I'll now get on with the interesting bits. That's breaking tips. Uh, I mean, making chips. I'm cheating a bit because I've got three of these to do and therefore I can select the video that best describes what I'm doing. You might notice a bit of dirt on one scene that doesn't appear on others, but never mind. <laughs> 
After a little foray into some of the issues surrounding these 60 to 70 year old castings, I found that they were at best distorted. Distorted up to a minimum of 3 millimeters out of flat on the back face. To remove the longitudinal and lateral errors I had to find both bearing centres. And to find the centre of both bearings I made some fitted bungs and turned centres into them. With a slight tap they sat in place. You'll notice that one of the bungs has got two small extra holes in it. With bolts in them I can remove one bung after the back face is cleaned up and then tap the other out from the inside. To lock the casting into position I used my grinding centres because they sit properly on the milling table. I didn't show this part but setting a bar between the two centres on the milling table there was only a 0.006mm error over 150mm. That's good. With the casting now between centres I had to lock the casting's rotation so that the back face would be skimmed removing as little material as possible and still leave a witness. The rotational stability came in the form of four hand tightened jacks. I normally stick a large steel ball in the top of these cuphead screws to provide better point of contact, but sometimes I end up using a hex nut in the top of the cap headed screw and then stick a smaller steel ball in that. It does the same job. On the underside at one end the surface is not level as it sports two equally opposed compound angled surfaces. However, with a suitable bit of flat bar the flat topped jacks remained stable while the skimming process was completed. The rotational error was shared out between both ends, meaning if there is a 2mm error at one end, the opposite must share the same error, so that after skimming there should be two opposing witnesses. A witness is a very small part of the original surface at two extreme opposing ends that are not machined usually as proof that a minimal amount of material has been removed to obtain the required outcome. Here you'll notice that while I'm taking a very light skim I constantly check that the jacks haven't come loose. They shouldn't because the cutting forces are incredibly light with this back face. One back face needed more material taken off so the jacks were tightened further and slackened for the finished cut. I did check the bottom face was at right angles to the spindle, otherwise this part would have been pointless. The bottom face will rest on the smallest parallel that I've got. The back face will rest against the 90 degree mounting plate. With everything clamped up this will ensure that the true bearing centre is at right angles to the table. This part of the machining process is purely to ensure that both the bottom face and the boss top face are true and parallel to each other. This will ensure that the bearings will seat properly. I had to stop the cut and fettle a tiny bit off the top of this casting otherwise I'd have been in a right mess. 
All of the work done so far is just to get the imaginary bearing centre line as near true as I can. The only dimension I won't know is the distance from the back face to the imaginary centre line. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter. This Bond mark of cars has a good worldwide following and ownership. They started with the development in 1948, then released them for general sale in 1949. Many people are of the belief that these two-stroke motorcycle engine powered cars are Kickstarter only. And I have to say that this is not true. Everyone had a primary starter unit to enable starting the car from inside the cab. This Kickstarter is remnant from the Villiers motorcycle engine, the engine that powers the car. It was left on in case of any emergency and due to the post-war times batteries were expensive and unreliable. Using the Kickstarter was a much cheaper way than buying a new battery. That's probably why people believe these cars needed to be booted into life. Anyway, back to the task in hand. This top face is being skimmed to remove the last trace of error out of the bottom face. This trace error can be seen as a witness here. Even after all this work I still can't cut the new bearing seats. In this shot you can see the reason is clear. You can see that the bearing seat is well mounted. This is because the original tapered bearing cup had a smaller bore than the casting. And the only way I could extract the bearing was by driving a butchered screwdriver into the casting in an effort to pry the old bearing out. This effort would have been vastly reduced if two simple swages had been cut to allow knockout access. So I'm putting a couple of small slots in the bore to assist the future removal of the new bearing. But I will have to be careful not to go too thin in the casting. The marking out was done with the aid of a pair of odd leg scribes working from the bore and the back face. The pointer is an old 6mm drill that's been sharpened on the grinder to a point and the slots were made using a 6mm two flute end mill. You can see here the casting error from the original machining operation. One slot needed two bites of the cherry, whereas the other slot only needed one cut. After a few strokes with a file, these two slots will have plenty of room for any future mechanic to get the bearings out without too much grunting or busted knuckles. Now, after all that prep work, I can finally cut the new bearing race recess and the roller cage recess at this end. But first I've got to set the coil centre to the bearing centre. I did this by disengaging the gearbox and using a probe clock on a mag mount. Once set the table was locked and the power feed was confirmed to be in the off state. Ah, uh, didn't quite think that through did I? Lucky the tool holder comes off. Now I can get on with breaking tips. Machining the taper end was quite a straightforward job. Apart from the fact that my fingers were numbed a little by the constant opening and closing of the grub screws. Now the slightly more involved bit. And that's how to get the second end true to the first end. Fortunately that too was an easy setup but first I had to take into account the cutter height then the casting and bong and then the parallel rollers and a little bit for just for good measure. <laughs> 
After all that, I forgot which way to turn the bolts to lock them. Scary. The idea here is to use the probe DTO in a more extended configuration around the bearing bung that's bolted to the table. When the machine is set, the table slides are again locked to prevent it moving. Doing this allowed the casting to sit over it and when the casting is truly vertical the top bearing bore will be true to the bottom bore. That was the plan anyway. But I have to get the bearing centre line perpendicular to the table first. This is done by placing the right angle block hard up against the back of the casting. Then by using two well placed ground rollers on each side of the bottom face before clamping everything together. The trouble is this is a chicken and egg situation. That is, having no more than one pair of hands, it becomes very difficult to set it true by using clamps to hold it in place. But I need to hold it in place to clamp it. I soon found a second pair of hands. I had to, I couldn't do it any other way. It's at this point I'm thinking, shall I visit the bathroom now or shall I wait till I have to? Oh yeah, time for a little dance around the floor, preferably without knocking anything over. This second end is the bore opening for the needle bearing set. The reason I chose the needle bearing set for this end is fourfold. One, it fits very snugly on the pivot tube. Two, it won't allow any sideways movement or vibration against the steering gear set. Three, very little material needs to be removed to fit the needle bearing set. 4. The thrust bearing needs to sit in a smaller recess than another taper bearing set. The last cut for this thrust bearing is a half millimetre diameter bigger and it goes down to about five millimetres off the bottom face. This is to allow grease to act like a dust cover around the edge of the top race. And the bearings will need an occasional greasing as before, but this is only to remove any dust that might have been trying to make its way in at either end. As I mentioned earlier, in order to fit the new taper roller bearing, I need a sleeve to fit the old bearing bore that's snug enough to fit over the new outer bearing race. I'm using a good quality extruded aluminium tube for this and being of good quality it will machine much better than the casting did. However, the machining made the material so thin that it rang like a bell. My cure was to stuff the ball with paper cleaning towel. That's the ball and the outside diameter done. I'm making three of these rings because I'm fixing three steering heads at the moment. And what I'm doing here is adding the lead. I left the paper in the ball while I parted off the first two rings. With it being tightly packed it should hold each ring well enough at the breakthrough point. 
On the last of these three rings I removed the paper and used the one finger retrieval method to prevent the ring going under the chalk. I must add that it's safer to use a pencil or something, not, not your finger. The lead on this ring is to aid alignment while it's being pressed into the casting. The ring on its own is too flimsy to press it into the casting by itself, so I press the outer race into the sleeve ring first. Then I press the outer race sleeve ring assembly into the casting. I know this is the best way to do this because the first one I tried the ring fitted perfectly but as I pressed the outer race in it pushed the ring into the ball. So I had to make another ring. After tapping the needle bearing set home, the thrust bearing set was fitted and as you can see it's flush with the casting face. It needs to be. The steering down tube was cleaned and thoroughly greased to prevent marring when the inner race is pressed on. At this point the casting can at last be reunited with the yoke down tube. This screw on collar used to be a combination of adjusting collar and top bearing due to the underside being tapered to fit the old top bearing race. It also provides a surface to which a top support clamp is attached. This clamp supports part of the steering gear, a part called the quadrant, and the top of the engine support down tube. Both of these items are in the background. This top bearing collar now has one less job to do, so the tapered underside can now be machined off. The top part of this collar sports a couple of flats and over the years Stilson's appear to have been the spanner or wrench of choice for adjusting it. Stilson's bite into the flats and surrounding area, chewing it up to resemble the branch of a monkey puzzle tree. And two flats is not enough so I'm going to mill a hexagon on the top at 46mm. At least one can buy a slim 46mm spanner or wrench. The threads on the top of this yoke down tube are too long and always have been. Now it means I can remove the top three threads. This one has already been done. I'm just cleaning this side and uh, I don't need to set it true really. It's not necessary at this point. I'm just deburring it to make sure that it sits nice and flat against the chalk face. This is where I remove the chamfer, approximately 6mm of it. A quick deburr and it's ready to go into the mill to have the hex flats machined in. To help set the collar onto the dividing head I clamped washers in the bore small enough to fit in the bore but not too small as to slip over the threads. This allowed me to nip the collar into the dividing head so that I could set it through using a suitable nudging device and a DTI. Then I positioned the dividing head on the mill table. The clamps would simply support the collar while the milling process was performed. Now it was a case of move the milling table in position to take a skim across the original flaps. I then established that 46mm was the best size across the flats for the knot 
And now I'd done that, I'd discovered where I needed to be and it was just a case of get on with it. The finish wasn't brilliant but I don't think the spanner or wrench will mind much. Before I pack the steering unit up I'll just put some grease on the bearings and make one last check by fitting the engine support tube. For those of you that may want to have a go or get a nearby and more local body to do the work for you, I've included two rough sketches with relevant information on the end of this video for you to copy. That's all for now and don't forget to subscribe. Bye.